On this episode, I sit down with Clint Van Dyke, who is a personal trainer, IFBB pro, and two-time black belt. Today, he shares how the attitude developed in the gym absolutely overflows into business. We also dig into his personal philosophy towards motivation, inspiration, and what holds people back. Most importantly, we talk about how to break down your goal into achievable results. Now, before we get started, go ahead and hit that subscribe button so you are in the know every time we drop a new episode connecting you with the top performing real estate agents across the nation. And without further ado, I'm your host, Sean Kunkler. What is happening, brother? Thanks for joining me. Not much. How you doing today? I'm good. So this is the way I kick it off with everybody, but I'll give everybody more context after the fact. But who are you and what do you do? I guess I have many titles. I guess first I'm a son, father, husband. Uh, professionally, I guess I would be titled a Sifu, a coach. Um, currently, I'm a full-time personal trainer. Um, and I definitely have a lot of certifications, titles, um, corrective exercise specialist, nutrition specialist, behavior change specialist. Um, I'm an IFBB pro in the men's physique division, but basically I'm just Clint to everybody. I don't really like to worry too much about my titles and accolades because, you know, it's at the end of the day, it's all about chasing the knowledge. It's not about promoting my titles. That is so true. So to give everybody context, I've, I've known you for two decades. At least, yeah. Actually, the last time you and I worked out, Charity posted a photo, like a, a before and after. It was 20 years ago. And then today, we're like, oh my God, we are like two skinny little kids. Yeah. <laughs> so you and I actually met at a Kung Fu school um, years ago when we were training. And then you eventually became program director. I eventually became your assistant. And then we, we ran to school together. Yeah. And I would actually echo highly, heavily what you just said about titles. You've never been one for titles. And, and I would say that's probably one of the things that's unique about you is you don't have this ego. I mean, with martial arts, there's a lot of ego. With fitness, there's a lot of ego. And you don't, you're very approachable. Thank you. Well, honestly, that's, it's funny you say that I'm approachable because my wife and I always make sure that she's with me in the gym if possible because you know, being a bigger guy, you know, when I train, I get a little loud and, you know, she feels like people find me unapproachable. And we definitely want to dispel that myth with people because, you know, our competition team, especially, we want everyone to know and our, you know, training staff, we want people to know that there's a seat at the table for everybody. You know, no one should be unapproachable just because you have titles and rank and things like that. You know, we want everyone to come along on our journey so we can all lift each other up or pull each other up. If the case may be. You actually bring up such a good thing is that you do have something for everybody. Everybody does have a seat at the table. And that's why we were talking briefly right before this, that this podcast is specifically for realtors and some are working out, some are not. And that's, that's exactly what we're talking about is like, how do we make it approachable for them to have a seat at this table? Because I know in my life, that working out keeps me sane for running this business and it just, it keeps me going. And I know you, your client base is a lot of executives, a lot of CEOs and not just fitness professionals who are competing, trying to take their game to the next level. Right. Yeah. We're actually really fortunate in that regard. I mean, we have our competition team that's for bodybuilding. We actually, we coach a lot of athletes in different fields baseball players, mountain bikers, surfers, motorcycle riders. We've got a couple uh, high school basketball players that we train on a regular basis. So, you know, I mean, it's really neat to have that full gamut of clients. And then in all honesty, our personal training base is mostly all business professionals. Like you said, CFOs, CEOs, business owners, you know, and the blessing in disguise for us is when COVID hit, and we had to move out of gyms because they were closing. Most of my clients came with me. And you talked about our martial arts background. That was such a blessing in disguise for me personally, because 
I knew how to cue people without physically touching them, as we have to do in group classes, right? We have to be able to point out, you know, turn your knee in, turn your hand out, whatever the correction may be. So for me, able to do that online was a very, very big blessing. So, you know, right away, I could transition a lot of my clients to online training. And now the cool thing is my business professionals love it because they never have to miss training now. When they go on a business trip to Europe, Hawaii, wherever it may be, they can hop on their phone with me, very similar to what we're doing now, take a tripod into the gym and we can train. So, I mean, it's a really cool transition that we were lucky enough to make pretty seamlessly when COVID all hit. That is huge. I love that the martial arts actually fed you a little bit to to get that going. It really did. And it's neat to see too, especially with some of our older clients. I mean, we have clients from my youngest right now is 16 and my oldest is 74. And the 74 year old loves doing Tai Chi. So we always warm up with that. And it's really neat to see her, especially really dig in more to the mental aspect of it. Cause I mean, the face of it, as we get older, our mental capacity starts to wane a little bit. So for her, we, we call it, we're going to put her on the brain train so she can really think and remember things, you know, so she really talks about how it helps her memory throughout the rest of the day and week, you know, and then she loves to do bad work. So we'll get out mitts and punch and kick. And I mean, it's wild what people will really enjoy doing once they get physically fit. We should, I should mention. So your black belts, plural, are in Kung Fu, Choi Lei Foot Kung Fu and Tai Chi Chuan which is like both of them are a lifetime of study. So it's, it's pretty impressive to have both, but that's awesome. Like being able to cater to radically different demographics and everything in between. I mean, somebody who's 74, obviously I'm almost 50 and my movement is much different than when I was 20. So I can only appreciate where it's going to be when I'm in my seventies. Right. Right. Although I just turned 50 on Monday. Happy birthday. And so thank you. I appreciate that. It's kind of neat though, when I'm in the gym and you know, you talk to different people and they say, well, I can't do that because I'm in my forties now. And I'm like, Hey, well, I'm in my fifties now. So, and we have clients in our seventies. So I want you to try to get rid of that excuse and let's get over that obstacle. Cause that's not a good reason anymore. It's totally not. I mean, with just all the, all the knowledge that we have collectively of just there's all these different life hacks. Like there's, there's zero excuse at this point. Um, mine was actually in talking to you, it was my motivation was my big hurdle was COVID and it was physically going to the gym. I was playing too many video games and drinking too much and I was getting fat and I was like, this is not my, this is not who I am. And so I built a gym and I built it at the house and I was like, like, how do I do this? And then that's when you started to help me with my programs and, and put it all together. Nice. Well, and that's honestly what, you know, one of our biggest things we try to do with clients is teach them how to remove obstacles that they, they honestly think are in their way, but they aren't necessarily unmovable obstacles. You just have to figure out how to get around them or over them and then develop good habits. You know, it's, it's definitely possible. And that's the thing is with fitness is, and I'm sure you get it all the time. And, and from, it's like from the martial arts world, people always look at us and they're like, Oh, you have such great discipline. And I was like, no, oh, I, <laughs> I always laugh to my, like, just like you did out loud, but it's always like, it's funny because I don't actually have good discipline. I just found things that I really enjoyed. And then I created an environment where it's a habit. Right. Right. That was it. That's like my, my secret formula is I'm consistent. I tried the, um, the get up at 5.00 AM workout, hundred percent does not work for me. That's like, and, <laughs> and that's I, okay. And I know it works for you and you did that for years, but I, that's like, that's not my thing. Mine is I'd rather work out at five o'clock at night, like five o'clock. That's my five is my hour. I usually hit it until six thirty, and then I'm done. But I like, that's where my brain is best. Like everything fires and, and I look forward to it no matter how horrible or hard my day is. Like, that's the thing I look forward to. Yeah. And honestly, that's one of the topics we talk about with every client is you don't have to do what I do. What I do works for me. So we have to figure out, just like you said, is waking up early going to work for you? 
or maybe working out at lunch. It's a nice break in the middle of the day. You go back to work refreshed, ready to go. Some people just like you like to train at the end of the day. So it's kind of like something to look forward to after a hard day at work. You know, you can work out. And it really pulls a lot of that stress away from the day, lets them calm down, and then they're ready to go home to their family, you know, make some dinner, relax for the rest of the night, and all the work's over. So it's all about finding what works. Yeah, and I would also stack on, it's also finding what works at different points in your life. Because when I was training at the school, I always practiced at lunch, like the, the, the 12 o'clock, the 12 to 1, no, it was 12 to 2. So I would always do the midday session. And then when I was working for athletic clubs, it was more the two to three section of the day. And then now it's the latter part of the day. And it's, I mean, for me, it's, it's evolved because it's just because of my business and I'm running it. And I, for me, when I'm fresh and my brain is fired up and I'm a hundred percent, I'd rather use that for emails and really deep thought and then use my body differently in the evening. Yeah. No, that makes sense. I can say from a stress relieving perspective, I would be dead in the water without fitness. Well, and it's funny. I laughed because when we talked about success there, I had a client literally was here on Thursday training with me and we were working on a new exercise and he said, wow, I really got to work on this. And I said, okay, that gives us some homework. He goes, okay, I'm going to get on it. And I said, That's the attitude you always have to have, the willingness to go and try. And he started laughing and he goes, honestly, that's been my secret to success my whole life. He goes, I just try. That's all you have to do to be 50% of the population in this world. Just try. That's all you have to do. And he goes, to beat another 25%, you just have to try consistently. Just show up and just keep going. And I started laughing. I was like, you realize that is literally the secret to most people's success is You just try, you show up consistently and you just don't give up. And then we started laughing and we were talking about how, you know, talent really only shows up in that last 10% of the valuation there, that equation, because you just have those couple factors and you already surpass, you know, most of the population on things you're trying to do. That is a hundred percent true. It's funny because I've, now interviewed a handful of agents across the nation who are succeeding at massive, massive levels. And I would say the common thread, the consistent thread with all of these people, male, female, old, young, everybody, it was, it all boils down to consistency, whatever, like they figured out the one thing that was working and they just did it a lot. Yep. Repetition. Yeah. Like if nothing else, if anybody doesn't get anything else out of this, just, understand that it's consistency. It's like with working out, it's consistently showing up. If right now I'm on a different path, I'm trying to actually lose some body fat. So now it's consistently eating correctly and adding in cardio and doing that with consistency, thus gets you the result. And so, I mean, it's like, if you want to market your business, then post consistently. It's yeah. There's no big secret. It's just, showing up. Honestly, that is the big secret, you know, keep it simple and just keep working at it. You know I mean? That is the biggest secret to everything. What do you think with people, let's say getting into fitness, they know they should, like they're not, they just don't feel, they don't feel great. And they know they, they, they want to get into it. What's the thing that usually holds them back? You know, it's usually a couple different things. And I, I call these the stressors that people have. Um, you know, and there's kind of the daily hassles that people have and then like the major life events. And those are generally the things that seem to be the biggest obstacle for people because, you know, I, I have a client right now. He's dealing with his two-year-old daughter not wanting to sleep in her own bed. So he just told me the funniest story about he and his wife watching their daughter on the nanny cam, how she figured out how to get out of her sleep sack and climb out of the crib. And she comes storming down the hallway and jumps in bed with them. And they do this over and over and over all night long. And so, you know, number one, it's putting a tremendous amount of stress on the wife. And then on the husband, he's trying to, you know, deal with the daughter so his wife can get some sleep because, you know, they both work, they both have careers to deal with. And it's just the hardest thing because they're sleep deprived. Yet he shows up and he actually asked me this morning, he said, well, what's better that I show up tired and consistent 
or should I get some rest and show up later in the day so I can, you know, put a little more effort into it. <laughs> and so it's kind of like, well, you kind of pick your poison on that one because either way, we're going to be at a little bit of a deficit until we can, you know, work past this with your daughter, you know? So there's always those little daily struggles that we have to overcome. And, and I told him, it's just do what you can today. We don't have to work out for an hour, eat every meal perfectly, get in your cardio, drink your gallon of water, like all these things that are another stressor, right? So I tell them, just do what you can today. At least, you know, get to the gym, get a half hour workout in, eat one or two clean meals. So at least tomorrow we have a building block to keep working from. We're not starting from a deficit. Yeah. You know, and then there's the other of major life, you know, events that, you don't have control of, you know, a death in the family. We've been dealing here in California with this crazy weather. You know, we've had clients that my 74 year old couldn't make it last week because the roads were literally flooded. So, I mean, these things happen sometimes. So I just had to tell her, let yesterday go. We'll get you rescheduled when the weather lets up. So it's, it's just letting go of things you can't control and controlling the things you can't control. It's funny because you go on social media and there's all these like 20 somethings who are preaching their motivation and inspiration, but they don't actually walk the walk. And what I think is cool is you ride motorcycles, you do track days and you've actually had a pretty significant spill, fractured ankle, fractured or, or sprained an ankle and fractured a wrist. And you and I hit the gym and you were literally in a cast. And you were like, well, I'm just going to work out the other side. <laughs> and I was like, that is awesome. Crazy, but awesome. Right. <laughs> but it was like, you know, you were like, this is what I have that I can do. So I'm going to do what I can do. And, and it was like, I just thought it was really, it was a, a very telling perspective of the way you view life because you didn't, you weren't all bummed about it. You weren't like, what was me or self-loathing? It was just like, well, this sucks, but this is what I got and I can use this. So I'm going to go do this. And we had, it was a great workout. Right. You know, and I mean, everybody has, you know, those kind of moments where it's, you know, life can consume you a little bit and you might get a little down and you might hit a pothole, but I mean, you just got to climb out and keep going forward. You know, and that's being successful is just keep showing up, keep going forward. So I don't know if you remember, uh, there was a sign. I can't remember what school it was. We visited one time. I think it was to do a seminar, but they had a sign that said, every black belt is a white belt that just kept showing up. Yeah. You know, and that, that's it. You want your business to be successful and just keep showing up and working on it. Yeah. Because there's going to be people that stop showing up because they get, you know, down or they don't believe in their business or, you know, things happen too. When I was doing martial arts, I certainly wasn't the biggest. I wasn't the fastest. I didn't have the best memory. I didn't have the greatest technique, but I showed up. I showed up to as many classes as I possibly could. And then I would sneak into the rest of them that I wasn't supposed to be at. Right. <laughs> Atta boy. <laughs> Funny enough, I showed up so many times, not only showed up, but I showed up early where Mr. Chin, my teacher, like I would call him and be like, Hey, I'm here. You're going to be here soon. And, it, and eventually it got to the point where he literally handed me the keys and he's like, just let yourself in from here on out. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, sweet. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's that dedication that wins out in the end. It totally does. It just, and I get, you know, to your point, it's, you don't have to, I think, I think with anything and everything, like if you literally take any aspect of your life and if you look at, let's say working out, and then you add in sleeping, resting, and then all the food and eating components, and then meal prep, and then drinking water. It's too many things. And if you want to be successful, you have to chunk it down into the smallest possible digestible thing until that becomes your habit. And then once that sticks, and I'm thinking now about this, like with, as a business, with marketing, it's like, don't try to like saturate all of this different types of marketing and, and blow these budgets, but just start that one thing, get that to work with success and then add one more thing 
and just slowly stack onto it. Yeah. Yeah. And honestly, that goes back to when we talk about with our athletes, we talk about different types of goals that they have. Um, we talk about outcome goals, which are basically the outcome and event, right? So we're talking about me and competing, you know, whether I get first place of a show or not, you know, we can talk about performance goals and that's going to be, you know, something like, did I beat my last performance or did I do worse than the last time I was on stage? And then we talk about process goals, which are something like, did I hit all the poses that I wanted in my routine? You know, and when you talk about those types of goals, if you focus on your process goals, hitting my posing routine, then the performance goal meets itself. I don't have to concentrate on it at all because then I will have beat my last performance. And if I hit those two goals, the outcome is going to be better than it was last time. And I don't necessarily mean by a first place trophy or second place trophy, but my outcome of my physique, how I feel about myself, how I feel about the show, my performance in general is going to give me more satisfaction. So, you know, if you focus on the right goals, the other things just fall into place naturally, you know, and it takes away a lot of the stress, you know, like we talk to our athletes about that outcome goal. You can't control who else shows up in an event, you know, but you can control how you perform at that event. So things will fall into place the way they're supposed to. Such a good philosophy. And it's, it's so elegantly simple. Right. It seems simple, right? Just like everything. <laughs> just focus on the work. Like if you yeah. just focus on the work, the, everything else just. Yeah. Is a well, and just like you said, your goal probably was not to get the keys from Mr. Chin and join his class, but your goal was to show up and try your hardest and just work and gain that skill. And then it led to you getting the keys. It led to you teaching that class a lot. I remember anytime he was out, he would have you teach it. It led to you working at the school with me and then you took over once I left. So, you know, these are all building blocks that just build on each other when you're putting in the effort. Yeah. I mean, it's so elegantly simple and it doesn't, I mean, it's regardless of what the goal is or what the the effort is, like whatever the, the thing, like you can literally insert anything and everything into that, that, and apply that same formula. Yeah. You know, with our clients, my main concern has always been to improve their quality of life. You know, as long as I'm improving their quality of life, I'm giving them what they need, what they want. They're moving forward. And, you know, the neat thing is to see, and this will definitely translate into the real estate world because, you know, if I have a client who comes in, and I, I remember years ago, I had a guy named Eric, he came in and very quiet, very timid, very shy, knew nothing about the gym or training. You know, he just was such a shy person. And the manager at the time at the gym where I worked literally told me, it was Vanessa, by the way, you know her. She said, hold Eric's hand and literally walk him through everything. So, I mean, we started him with walking around the gym, just introducing him to people showing what the different equipment was and fast forward six months, you know, the guys coming in, talking to other people before our sessions, a few months later, he starts not putting his sweatshirt on and showing me he's got new muscle on his shoulders and his arms. And you could just see the self-confidence developing in him. And eventually another six months later, he had a new job at work, a promotion, like he and his now husband decided to pull the trigger and get married. Like, there were just all these cool things that started happening in his life. And I mean, I don't want to try to take credit. I changed this guy's life, but we just focused on developing him into the best person he could be. And that was physically and mentally and emotionally, you know, and all these things started falling into place in his life. That's huge. I mean, I know for me in my life, personally doing martial arts, hundred percent transformed who I was as an individual. And then rolling that through my injuries and things like that, moving it over more into weight training and just changing it up a little bit. But yeah, I mean, it, when you work out, you are changing your, your chemical makeup, like you're releasing endorphins and dopamine and you're feeling good. And 
that becomes a byproduct that it flows into your other relationships and it changes. It starts to actually change the way you're viewing the world. Absolutely. And, you know, seeing my clients go down that life path, I would imagine it's very similar to someone who has a young couple that they show houses to, you know, these people can envision themselves in this house and you finally find the right one. You know, I would imagine it's pretty satisfying knowing these people are going to build a family here and have kids and, you know, develop this entire life in this home that you found for them. You were part of that process. You know, it's gotta be an amazing feeling. It's gotta be the same. Yeah. I would definitely say it is like, it's like our shelter is obviously one of the, the three human needs, but like protecting our physical being is, I would say the first, because without it, none of this other stuff actually will ever exist because we won't be here. Um, what motivates you personally in your training? Is it the, is it more the day to day? Like, do you apply the same formula that keeps you excited and motivated and inspired like for your own personal training and your own journey? It definitely changes throughout time. Like you said, you go through different stages. Um, I remember quite a few years ago when I had just left the Kung Fu school and I remember I was hanging out at home one night and I was just thinking about, you know, becoming a full-time personal trainer and what that would mean to me. And to me, like I talked about just helping people bring a better quality of life. And then I started to realize for me personally, something that's always really helped me. And I remember Sifu Jason Wong said this to me when I was at the studio, he wanted me to start teaching classes and helping out with the instructors program. He said, because you look like an instructor, you act like an instructor. And he said, you're an instructor, whether you're instructing in a class or not, because people see you that way. You know, and for me in the beginning with personal training, it was very much, I wanted to look the part and be the part. You know, I wanted to show people that, you know, I used to be 150 pounds. I was 130 when I started Kung Fu when I was 21 years old. So, I mean, to develop myself physically over all these years, I don't have any special talents or genetics. You know, I had terrible genetics, but through years and years of development and practice, you know, for me, just being able to show people this is possible. You can do it too, you know, and helping people motivate themselves through just me showing up and working with them too. You know, I think that was a big motivator for a long time, just wanting to be the part. Um, and, but once I started competing, then of course that animal took a turn where, you know, I was doing it for the shows. I was doing it for the trophies to win the placings. And what's interesting is once I got to the pro level and I had a bunch of guys that used to compete with me and we would all, you know, come in first, second, third, we all went to nationals together. You know, we all got our pro cards together. My very first pro show, I was looking around the stage and I was the smallest guy on the stage. I mean, there were five guys who had already been to the Olympia, which is like the Super Bowl of bodybuilding for the listeners that don't know. That's huge. Yeah. And I was like, I'm in some pretty crazy company here and I have a lot of work to do. And I mean, I came in like 12th place at that show. And then my next four shows as a pro, I was nowhere near the top 10. And that's when a lot of my peers started to quit competing because when you're in the amateur leagues, we were the big deal, right? We were winning first, second, third, every show. And I think for them, it became about winning the trophies and telling people I got first place at this show. And I think for me, the transition was I started to look more at the intrinsic value of what I was doing, the internal value of beating my last performance, coming in better than the last time, you know, improving my physique. And then I noticed the people that I talk to in the gyms, they really don't care what placing I get. They just see me going on this journey and my physique changing and all these cool things happening. And then they see photos and they just get so motivated and inspired by it that, you know, once I realized that transition, it changed for me where I just wanted to see how good I could become physically on stage and improve every show. And that's honestly what 
you know, it's kind of been going on that way for the last eight years is just seeing if I can improve tomorrow, be better than today, you know, and I think it really helps people feel that. And, you know, like I said earlier, we're pulling people along with us as we go, or we're pushing people ahead of us as we go. So, you know, it seems to really bring everyone along on this journey. That's a great way to stay motivated and engaged just as simply as wanting to show up better tomorrow and just keep pushing that forward. Success breeds success, right? So the more successful you are in your business, the more people want to work with you. Yeah, that's a hundred percent true. And it's, and the more people you have around you, the more that are attracted to that. So there's, it, it definitely comes with it, but I mean, not for nothing, but if I have the option of, of working with somebody who's a professional X, Y, Z, and they have the awards to show for it versus somebody else, I'm going to pick the, per, I'm gonna, I want to always work with the absolute best of the best because time is money. And I want to go from A to Z as quickly as possible, like every single time. And I came from the fitness world. I know tons of trainers, but I always text you. I'm like, right. I'm like, hey man, I'm trying that. to do this. <laughs> <laughs> well, and we have to always remember too, you know, once you get into that pattern of successful behavior, it increases your confidence and that leads to further successful behavior. So, you know, we tell our kids all the time, my wife and I, we have two teenage boys that the people you hang around, the people you spend time with are going to help you identify and become the person you are becoming. So we tell them, if you want to get good grades, if you want to be good on the basketball team or whatever sport it is, hang out with the kids that are good at those things. Don't hang out with the kids that are not. And I mean, honestly, it's the same thing as we become adults. You know, you want to be successful, spend time with successful people. Yeah. Before I had a black belt, I hung out with only black belts. <laughs> I wedged my way into that group and I was like, I'm going to just get pulled up to this level because that's where I wanted to be. It's true. It's, I heard a, a great quote years and years ago. It was your net worth is equal to your network. And it's, I mean, that's, if you're hanging out like you, if you're training with CEOs and top level execs, which we're in Silicon Valley, they're, we have all the, the biggest of the big companies here. Like that's, that's proportionate with, with the, the level of work you're able to do. And as a realtor, if you want to be selling the luxury real estate, but you're hanging out at the library, that's, it's probably not the right place. Not to say the library is not a good place, but it's not where people who have that high net worth are hanging out. They're hanging out at the country club. Right. Yeah, exactly. I'm trying to look through my notes here really quick, see what direction to take this. Well, and actually I thought of something interesting the other day too. And I wanted to ask you about, because, you know, we're talking about in real estate, do you notice there is, I mean, obviously there's a difference and this is kind of what got me on this train of thought. So for some people getting into fitness, there are some people, it has to be a very emotional push, right? Their doctor has to tell them you're in really bad shape. You're going to die in the next six months unless you start exercising, right? So for some people, they need that big push to go do something. And it kind of made me think about how the real estate market was during COVID, right? A lot of people, you know, got kicked out of apartments or had to relocate. So I imagine the real estate market had a lot of change to it. And then it kind of got me thinking about where I have a lot of clients who very much invest in their health and fitness in the future of their health and fitness by staying consistent over time. And then I started thinking about real estate. You know, obviously you have people that invest in real estate. So have you noticed kind of a change in those two aspects during COVID or is it kind of leveled out now that we're kind of past that arena? You know, I think if you look at any significant part in our lives when we make a radical decision, we're usually pushed and pulled simultaneously to do it. We're trying to avoid something while working towards something else. Like in fitness, the push and pull would be avoiding being fat, but being pulled towards looking fit. 
And so you have two opposing forces. I know those probably aren't the most PC, but they're the ones I thought of on the fly. Um, with real estate, the uh, during COVID when everything was just going bonkers, is the cost of money was really low. And, you know, just not to make it all boring and dry, but if let's say hypothetically you're spending a million dollars on a property and the mortgage rate goes up 1%, your buying power goes down a hundred thousand dollars from that one percent, which in turn means if you're still spending that million dollars on the property, your um, monthly rates just went up astronomically. So, if your mortgage rate drops significantly, let's say three points, which we saw during COVID, which people were getting two and three percent loans your mortgage rate is aggressively low. So the cost of money is super low. So people would, it made more sense if you had cash to just dump it into something, anything than to hold on to it. Okay. And to your point, I think when people have um, an outside force that's motivating them, like a very low interest rate, people went bonkers. And then now we have, we have two forces. We have an increase mortgage rate. So we have people, there's a pain in buying. And then we have um, these big companies are laying off people. So now we have fear of risk. And so people don't, they want to kind of hunker down and, and you'll hear like, we'll wait and see. Um, what's interesting about me and to go back to martial arts is I had asthma growing up. And I was in and out of the emergency room from probably the first full decade, decade and a half of my life. And then I had pneumonia a couple of times. And I remember that at one point, a doctor was like, listen, you have to really, when I was young, super, super young, they were like, you have to physically take care of yourself and you have to work out. And laying on the couch as like an eight-year-old on a Sunday I remember these Kung Fu movies would just play all day. And I was, I didn't know at the time, but I was like enamored with these guys who were dancing around on the screen, but not, they were moving around each other in a beautifully elegant way where they weren't getting hit, but they were hitting. And that's what started me on the path of martial arts and, and that want and drive for fitness. And then as I got later or later in life, that's when I basically used that. But I think, you know, to relate it to martial arts or to relate it to somebody buying, it's it's pain and pleasure, really. And then I would say the other overlapper or overlapping thing with real estate is not so much with investing, but for individuals. But it's it's usually death, death, divorce, and babies are are kind of your your big drivers because those are forcing a hand like they're regardless of what the economy is doing, regardless of mortgage rates, regardless of your health. If somebody passes, let's say your, your parents pass away. Now you have this empty house. It's okay. You either become a landlord or you sell it. And so it doesn't matter what the market is doing. You sell it. Um, or if somebody gets a divorce, obviously it's doesn't always make sense to keep it. And then babies, if you have kids and you're, yeah, you, you're like, okay, we actually need another room. We need, we need to expand. Or when the kids leave the, the house of, yeah, we no longer need these three bedrooms. Let's, let's, let's pare it down a little bit. That's interesting because death, divorce, and babies are pretty big drivers in the fitness industry too. Right. I mean, I've definitely had clients come and say, I had a aunt who passed away recently. She was morbidly obese. We think that had a lot to do with her health issues. I've, she promised me to lose weight so I wouldn't follow in the same path. And so, you know, I put people on weight loss programs and of course, divorce, if you're looking for a new partner, you want to get in good shape or, you know, you need to just relieve stress, you know, <laughs> and then definitely, I honestly, it's funny because new parenting is a huge driver for fitness for a lot of people because, um, you know, especially some of my male clients, when they start having kids, they realize like, okay, I've let my body go. I've been focused on my business for so long. Okay, I'm financially stable. We own our home. 
we're married. Now I have a kid. Now I got to make sure I can play with my kid and live long enough to see this child grow up. So it's interesting that that's a huge driver for fitness for a lot of parents. That was my catalyst. I, we, it was right as COVID, like some of the rules and things were changing a little bit. And we took a short trip to Hawaii and there was a picture um, that I looked at, like after we got back and I was like, dude, this is not me. <laughs> right. This is not how I want to be. I'm like, this is not like with a, with all the fitness that I've been involved in in my entire life. I'm like, this is just not, it's not the path I want to go down. It's not the path I want to continue. And, you know, and, and now thinking about it, the the fear was that my mother had heart issues. My grandfather um, had a like quadruple bypass my other grandfather had emphysema, so lung issues. And I was just like, I can't let my body deteriorate, especially with how many hours I'm working in real estate and, and all of these things that I'm doing. I need to physically be able to show up for all of these other life activities. And that was really the that figurative straw that broke the camel's back of like, I just, I don't want to keep going down this path. I have to change directions. Unfortunately, that's sometimes what it has to take for some people, that emotional response. I mean, they always say emotion drives motion, right? So, and it's funny you mentioned the picture because I actually have done that with clients before where they, a couple of people I've trained have very big problems with overeating. And so I had them uh, take a picture of themselves in the mirror without their shirt on and then put the picture on their phone as one of their favorites. And then I said, okay, every meal from now on, when you order food or you go to your pantry, you make something, I want you to look at that picture and say, do I want to continue looking like this? Or do I want to not eat this food, you know, and change the way I look? And it's funny, but those photos are such a great motivational tool. They are. I, I think for me, the big motivator um, recently in the shorter term was is I look at food as fuel. I really try to view it as just fuel. And, and then I also think of it as time. And so if I look at a piece of cake, I'm like, okay, is this fuel? It's not. And then do I really want to spend that time on the bike or taking a run or doing something else to, to make up for this, like two minutes of joy I'm going to get from eating it. And I'm, Obviously, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's it's interesting you say that because I actually, most men burn about 100 calories for every 10 minutes of activity. Women are a little different, but most guys, that's about the number. And whenever I have someone and we're talking about nutrition, that's exactly what I ask them. Like, okay, that cookie's probably 150 calories. Is that worth 15 minutes on the treadmill to you? Because to me, it's not worth it. Like I would just rather not eat it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, I would rather not eat it. And if I'm hungry, then I really need actual food. Right. 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 Although I will say everyone has their own vices. And I tell all my clients, like, it's okay to have a vice. Like for me in the off season, when I'm not competing, I enjoy putting creamer in my coffee. I know it's a funny <laughs> thing to say. And it's only like a recent thing I started in the past couple of years. I've drank my coffee black. Since I ever started drinking coffee, but a good friend of mine, I went out to visit him at his ranch. He had all these creamers in his fridge and he was like, yeah, I don't even like coffee. I just like all these creamers. And he's like, you want to try some? And I was like, well, all right, you know, and they're so tasty. <laughs> I was like, you know what? I need a vice in my life because I don't really drink or, you know, smoke or do drugs anymore. So I need at least one vice in my life I can enjoy, you know, here and there. That is hilarious. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, once in a while, I went to lunch the other day, and the, there was a, a one of my uh, mem staff members got a cookie, and I had like a piece of it. But I did. I mean, I literally think of like, oh man, do I want to work this off? And I was like, yeah, today I will. Yeah, yeah. Today sometimes it's worth it. You know, sometimes it's not. I mean, I would say for a realtor, the hardest thing is we your, your schedule can get just totally filled and you're just like running from appointment to appointment and to appointment and you will eat anything that's in your path because 
you go these crazy amount of hours and you're like, oh, I'm just so hungry right now. I have to just like smash food into my face. Now, would it help you as a realtor to have meals with you, like meal prep food in a cooler in your trunk? Then you could easily pop one out, eat it real quick between clients. Yeah. I mean, I got this, I, I kind of stole it from our conversations, but I, um, I usually keep like protein powder, just the powder available or I'll take a shaker with me and then I can mix it if I'm, if I just need a little something to carry me over for like another hour. Um, and then I try to plan my moves. So if I'm showing a property and I know there's a microwave there, I'm like, that's awesome. And then I, I have a cooler. I just throw it in my car and then I'll have, um, I actually don't have time to, to meal prep the way that I used to. So I actually just order food that's prepped for me and it's all, it's clean. It tastes really good. And then I go that route and then I just have it available. Um, the other thing I did, which I told you about is I put in my calendar, I eat four times a day. And it just shows up on my calendar. So I don't, my secret of discipline is I try to take anything I have to think about out of my brain and just put it somewhere in a reminder or somehow I I take it and move it over. So when this alert comes up, I just know to do this thing and then I'm back on my day. But then I have, I'm kind of formulaic is I typically have a similar breakfast every morning. So I don't have to weigh or count the calories. I know, I know what that's going to cost me. I know how much is in the shake. I know I have my kind of my go-to things. And so it, it's a little bit easier. It's not easy by any stretch, but it's easier. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's what we talked about earlier, right? Removing those barriers and making our habits easier. Right. I mean, I'm the same way. I literally eat, every two and a half to three hours, almost on the dot. And my meals are honestly almost the same every single day. I have a little bit of variety here and there, uh, but I just try to remove as many variables as possible. Yeah. One thing we have been doing though, this would be a great one for you is an air fryer. Oh, I'd love it. Yeah. So the one we have has two drawers, so you can actually cook, you know, double the amount of food or two different things at the same time. And you literally just toss it in and walk away. And then it cooks while you're off, you know, checking email or talking to clients. It's actually a great tool that we've been using quite a bit recently. I would say the air fryer. So we have two teenage boys here who eat (laughs) so much food. Um, So we actually have two air fryers to just, so we can make a full meal. So you can like throw salmon in one and then throw your vegetables in the other and then just have them have them going. Um, but yeah, I, we swear by that thing. It's, that's a game changer for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And then I know the other thing you guys do just cause I see it on your Instagram all the time is you'll cook a whole bunch of food all at once, like throw it on the grill and then have it all ready to go. Yeah. That makes things a lot easier just because if you're cooking, you know, every day or every meal, it's a lot of work between the cleanup and the, you know, process of it all. But if you can cook large amounts, it's already ready. You just pull it out. And for us, we weigh most of our food. Um, you know, people don't need to go to quite those extremes, but you know, it makes it easy, you know, especially after you've been weighing for a while, you can kind of visually see the amounts pretty easily. So when you're out, you kind of know if you're overeating or, you know, just getting in way too many calories that you don't need. Yeah, I would say, and and I got it, like this is a different this is a very, it's a, it's adding a layer of complexity. Most people aren't going to start here and I would not recommend starting here, but I've, I've weighed at different points in my, my life. And you're right. Once you start understanding how much, how many calories you're going to physically burn in a day and then how many you need to put in, you can have an idea by looking at something of how that's going to fit into the overall scope of your day. Yeah. And I mean, it's all about keeping the scale what's right for you, right? What's going to be convenient for you and your business and family. Um, I mean, we honestly, we take our food with us almost all the time. Like, I mean, I've even brought food to Legoland before when I was competing. You know, I, I don't recommend it. It's not that fun to sit there and eat, you know, 
chicken and rice and veggies while your kids are enjoying some, you know, big cinnamon rolls and some yummy fruit and juice. But, you know, I, sometimes you have to make sacrifices for your goals. You know, short term suffering can lead to, you know, long term, you know, uh, achievements, I guess I should say. Yeah, I would say that's probably by far the hardest piece. And I would say probably most people struggle, will struggle with is having teens or other people who are not eating the same thing as you. And then it's that food is just, it's around and having the, the mindset to, to not eat it. That's hard. Yeah, it is, you know, but it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier. You know, I think one of the reasons I've been lucky enough to be very successful as a competition coach and personal trainer is I lead by example. I don't ask my clients to do anything that I'm not willing to do. Um, You know, so I try to just show that I'm being the best of the best out there as far as coaches or trainers. So that, you know, hopefully, you know, and and we really don't do any sales or advertising for clients. We haven't, I don't think ever really other than our Instagram and our website and our website. I think we put it together years ago. We've never touched it. Um, but really all of our business comes from word of mouth, um, from existing clients. And, you know, I would assume that comes from, you know, us just walking the walk, talking the talk and, you know, just showing our clients that we're willing to do what they're, we're telling them to do, you know? So when our clients, friends, family, peers see their success, they also want to, you know, get in on that success. So, you know, they ask who their trainer is or who their coach is. And that's honestly how we've gotten all of our business in the past few years. It's all been just word of mouth. If there's any realtor out there worth their salt, the bulk of their business is referrals. So they can totally identify with show up, do really good work. And then people, People will shout out about you. And I agree. I mean, I've obviously known you for years and have been following your Instagram for as long as, as long as you guys have been on it and there's no sales pitch ever. Like it's never like, there's just never a sales pitch to it. And, and I think that's a, that's a valuable piece that sometimes people overlook. They think if I'm always selling, then, then these, these people will be attracted to me. And it's actually the opposite. Well, and honestly, it's, it's kind of a good thing that we don't have to do a lot of salesmanship because, you know, with the type of clients that we have, business professionals, business owners, they don't want us posting half naked photos of them. Like, oh, look at the transformation of, you know, Jim this week and, you know, then colleagues of theirs see it. So, I mean, we're really fortunate in that fact that we don't have to do those types of tactics because our clients want that privacy. And that's a really, I feel like it's a very nice thing that I can offer my clients is a lot of privacy and a lot of flexibility. You know, I honestly, with a lot of my clients who are high level professionals, I mean, I might have them scheduled for 6 a.m. one day and I'm not joking. I have one guy, uh, he's the CEO of his company. We rescheduled him four times in one day because he had a 6 a.m. session scheduled with me and something came up with his daughter. So we said, okay, let's push it to nine. And then he had a colleague call that needed to discuss some investment opportunities. So he let me know, let's push it to three. And then three o'clock rolls around. I'm waiting. He's not here. And he said, okay, charge me for this session, but I still want to train with you tonight. So we ended up training at seven o'clock at night, you know, but he was nice enough to say, okay, I didn't make it to our three o'clock. Go ahead and charge me for it. Let's still get it in tonight. I'll pay you twice, you know? <laughs> well, good on him for still showing up. <laughs> That's what I said. I said, you know what? I know this is a really tough day for you. And I'm sure it was just, I'm not the top priority, you know, necessarily in his life because he's got his business around. I mean, it's a multi-million dollar company, but he had that commitment that he wanted to make it because he doesn't want to let me down. I mean, that's a huge part of it. He told me in the beginning that he was committed to getting in shape and he just, no matter what, he was going to make it happen. So I told him, you know, I'll be as flexible as I can. Obviously I have other clients. I can't give you their spots, 
but I'll do anything I can to help you reach your goals. And I mean, he really appreciates it and it shows in his effort, you know, and that's really what it comes down to. I want my clients to put as much effort into our training as I'm putting into it, you know, and that's how that success builds. Dude, that's a CEO mentality right there. Like, I don't care. Hell or high water. <laughs> it's happening. It's yeah. I mean, it's, it's funny. I, you'd listen to people's language that they use. And when like even describing the CEO, you could just tell like when people are like, don't worry about it. Like I'll take care of it. Just rebook me. It's, it's a different mentality than, than trying to actually get out of doing the work. Um, so do you see the bulk of your clients? Are they face to face? Are they online? I know you do, you've done a mix because of COVID, but what's, what are you seeing now as like your, your, what's normal, I guess. Honestly, I would say I'm still about 70% online. Wow. Because a lot of my clients who were here when COVID first hit moved to different states or purchased a second home. And now they spend a lot of their time in that second home. Um, but I mean, honestly, it's, it's one of those things where you can get it in. And I think that was honestly one of the best things to happen for the fitness industry during COVID is people realized we don't have to be in the same gym at the same time to get you a good workout. You know, people realize like I have a client, he went to Italy last week and we jumped online for me. Of course, it was the middle of the night when we trained, but you know, I was happy to get up at, you know, three 30 in the morning and train him. And then I went back to bed. Um, but it really, I think opened people's eyes to the opportunities in the fitness industry. Um, you know, and I think with my people that are in person, you know, it was touch and go there for a while during COVID. Of course we had to wear masks to make everyone feel comfortable. And then, you know, Luckily, we had transformed our garage into a fitness room and we started training people here or we would go to their houses. You know, we would just try to be as careful as possible. And I mean, knock on wood, no one that trains with us ever got sick from our facility or training with us. You know, everyone was really careful and safe. It really, and then we have our online clients, competitors and things in different countries that will call and want us to develop programs for them. So it's, it's really nice that we have the flexibility to really have a lot of different avenues to work with people as opposed to just in person at a gym, you know, and like I said, it, it goes back to the martial arts, you know, without having that verbal cueing, I wouldn't have been able to, I think, make that transition as easy. I know a lot of trainers who, really struggled with that verbal cueing because they were used to pushing down on someone's shoulder if it was coming up as opposed to telling them, you know, relax your right shoulder, roll it back a little bit, get it in the proper position. And I think going back to the martial arts really helped me too, because I always saw this as a fun challenge. Like I would have clients who would only have one band at home or one dumbbell. And they were like, well, we can't train because I only have one dumbbell. I'm like, We'll make it work. Don't worry. I'll figure out a whole workout for you. You know, and I had a lot of trainer colleagues who that's one thing that drove them out of the industry. They were like, well, no one has a gym at home. And I'm like, you don't need a gym. I mean, you can get a great workout with a minimal amount of equipment. And most of the time you can get a great workout with just body weight if that's all you have. You know, so I thought it was a fun challenge, you know, and I think, you know, for a lot of people, it just became a little too overwhelming for them. Oh, that's stress. That's a good way to look at it. I mean, it's just, it's a puzzle and you've figured it out. It's, I'm, it's funny, all those different things that you described, I'm like, yeah, that was me. Like, I remember ordering all this gym equipment, but everything was on back order. So I had a barbell, I think one kettlebell and maybe 30 pounds of plates. And then I pinged you and I was like, what can I do with this? <laughs> I was like, I don't have a rack. I don't have a bench. I don't have like, I didn't have tons of stuff and you still, um, I have it somewhere, but you cobbled together a workout and then I got more pieces and I was like, all right, man. So now I got this and you're like, all right, cool. Now we'll stack on these things. And now I, which I have to show you, I'll, I'll have to send you a photo is, I mean, it's like, 
it's a gym. It's awesome. But I have like pretty much every piece of equipment I can, can want. It's great. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, now there's no excuse for you. You, you know, you can't use the excuse. Well, I don't have a gym. I got a full gym at home. <laughs> you can make it happen. My excuse, I'm doing air quotes, but the reason was with my, my work is my work was my priority and it's my livelihood. And I couldn't afford, let me rephrase. I didn't want to afford driving to the nearest gym, which was about 30 minutes away and then driving back. That's an hour and then doing a workout. And I really genuinely, and then it was COVID. So there was limitations there. And I just, I, I wanted to figure out how to take away all the resistance. And that's why I ultimately decided to, to build out something at the house because I, I want the convenience of literally changing my clothes and running downstairs and hitting the gym. And, and I have zero excuse. And then my other thing that was creating excuses for me was my food of, I didn't have time to meal prep. And I was like, okay, so what am I willing to do to work around that? And then um, it's the same thing. I remember pinging you and like, Hey, do you have any good meal prep companies? Like, what do you think of this one? And then I landed on a company that they send me, I think seven meals a week. And so it's enough to give me one meal a day or a little over. And so then I can normalize that piece. Um, but then interestingly enough in my journey, getting back into it, we, you and I did a bunch of sessions on video and then we I've worked out at your house and then we've gone to this gym together. So I have definitely experienced all of those different, the different avenues. Well, and it's interesting too, because I have a bunch of clients who, you know, I used to train in person at a gym before COVID hit and then they went online and just like you're describing, they don't want to go back to a gym now because the convenience of literally being online for work, walking down to their garage where their gym is training with me, they can walk back upstairs, change their shirt and be back on a call with, you know, whoever in the company within moments, there's no driving back to the office, changing, showering, like all that, you know, and then they can hop in the shower later in the day when they get the time. So it's, it's neat how the convenience has really changed for people in the fitness industry. It has. And I would say my favorite part is I can just listen to anything that I want to. <laughs> I don't have to wear headphones. No one's going to talk to me. I don't have to deal with anything. I just go in there and it's my little sanctuary. Absolutely. I know I have a client who's a CFO and he said, okay, I got to wrap up a couple minutes early because I have a meeting. He goes, I got to go put on my other shorts and my slippers and then a nice, you know, work collared shirt. <laughs> He goes, this is the best. I get to your meetings with my slippers on. <laughs> Dude, I, this whole work from home was, it's so incredibly efficient. Like the amount of time we sat in our cars or do sit in our cars is ridiculous. So I don't, again, I, I think if nothing else is you figure out the thing that's holding you back and there's, there is a workaround if you just step outside of the box and think about it a little bit more creatively. Um, well, listen, man, it's been an hour that railed by. So thank you. I appreciate that. Um, if somebody wants to reach out to you and they want to pick your brain and learn more about your training and training style, what is the best way for them to find you? There's a couple different avenues. Our website is Van Dyke Fitness. So I think it's www.vandykefitness.com. They can always email me directly at Gmail. So it's just Clint Van Dyke at Gmail, C L I N T V A N D Y K E at Gmail. Um, there's also our Instagram. We get a lot of people jumping on there and DMing us. Um, and that is my wife's name, Charity, C H A R I T Y. I believe there's an underscore and then my name, Clint, and another underscore and then Van Dyke. Uh, but Clint Van Dyke and Charity Van Dyke are two pretty unique names. Um, I think if you do a search on any avenue, you'll find this pretty easily. Yeah. You'll come up number one. Um, and, and, and we'll, I'll actually leave all of the, uh, these contact points in the description so somebody can very easily find you. Nice. nice. All right, man. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Really appreciate having me on. It was definitely a pleasure and honors all mine. And that's a wrap.